What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Rooted in Resilience podcast. We are testing out our upgraded audio equipment today, so hopefully today's audio is a little bit improved relative to the previous episodes. And it is a perfect time because we are so excited to have Lindsay Milis on the podcast today. We're going to call her a nourishment-focused midwife. And so we are so excited to dive into all things home birth, the difference between placentas based on the mother's diet, and so much more. So, Lindsay, would you like to start and kind of give us a little introduction of what you do and what a day-to-day looks like for you? Yeah. Hi, you guys. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm so honored to be here. Um, like you said, my name is Lindsay Milis. Um, I am a traditional midwife that um, spends most of my practice focused in uh, intuition, nutrition, um, and listening to moms and families. That's one of the most important pieces. Um, taking a step back and and you know instead of being with my head in the book all the time, it's really like stepping into a space where I get to sit back and listen because that's all of those stories that are there. Everything that they're telling me is is where like the true juice, like the the bulk of how we should be practicing is at um, my day to day. I mean, we've already had to reschedule this podcast once because of a birth, right? So I'm on call 24 seven. I've been in the birthing community for almost 20 years now. Um, my, I, I don't have a schedule. I literally like ed, any plan that I make, it's like, if I'm not at a birth, I'll be there. Um, and so that involves being up at three o'clock in the morning. That involves me missing my kids' birthdays, that involves all of that. And so it's definitely a lifestyle that um, I've had to choose. And um, it's it's nothing more than the greatest honor in the whole world to serve women and their families in this experience. The first, actually, I think we've had to reschedule this two times. Have we? The first time you had a birth. <laughs> yeah. And then oh, the second yes. time we you had guys a goat had birth. A birth. Yes. We had our first goat birth at the farm. Um, so amazing. And, yeah. So that's that's funny. Um, yeah, so we're a little bit more versed in animal births than human births, so it's which is actually the best thing in my personal opinion. Really? Anybody that enters into birth with the understanding and the reverence around animal birth usually births so much more beautiful. One of my favorite obstetricians is a French obstetrician. His name is Michel Odant, and he, gosh, he must be in his nineties now, and he grew up on a farm. And so, you know, the way that he talks about birth is the way that he witnessed birth growing up in a farm. And he transferred that over into his obstetrical practice. But it's just been absolutely amazing to have the comparison of the two. We have never experienced birth, you know, in person, human birth. And it's just like this topic that seems to be feared. Like it's like, oh gosh, that day is going to come for you and you better prepare yourself because it sucks. But we've now experienced two births at the farm so far, our goat birth. And it was just incredible to watch. And then we just watched our livestock guardian dog birth. I watched Mm. her pop out 12 puppies. Oh, amazing. And just like seeing her know exactly what Mm -hmm. to do. Like no one trained her. She just had this innate wisdom of what she needed to do. And it was just the most beautiful thing to watch. Like have her eat up all those placentas, mm-hmm. clean up all of her babies. It was it was truly beautiful. And it definitely happened at 2 a.m. But mm-hmm. I'm very happy that we were able to witness that. Yeah. I mean, you said it right, that innate ability. Like birth is made to work. For millennials, we've been giving birth without having this obstetric medical complex that's dictated the way that we give birth. And so um, like kind of my tagline, if you will, is great grandma wisdom. And that's because it is the most normal physiological process that we will go through. It's just the same as being like, oh, I have to take a poop. I need to go to the bathroom and relieve myself. And it's it really should be that simple, but we've complicated things so much. And that actually brings me to the point of this is a charged conversation and there's a lot of fear around birth. And so whenever I have these pod- podcast conversations, I really like to like take a collective breath together. And all of your listeners that are listening, it's really nice to kind of like ground yourself in because the amount of fear and um, stories that we've been told are from, um, you know, maybe the past three or four generations where our great-great-grandma's 
maybe even our great grandmas, um, birth really got brought into the hospital about 1930. Um, and so let's do that really quick. Let's just kind of take that collective deep breath and kind of settle in. If you're driving, do not close your eyes, please. And just breathing in down into your lungs and down into your belly, down into your womb space. And just kind of settling yourself into this space, exhaling when you need to, feeling that collective pulse, that collective energy that everybody on this call right now is listening to. This call should be a remembrance. These stories, these memories of good birth stories are in your bones. If birth wasn't made to work, we would not be here today. So if you feel yourself getting charged in any way, I just invite you to come back to your breath and this collective space that we're holding. Beautiful. All right, let's dive in. That was beautiful. I think we need to have you, or we need to remember to do that on all of our podcasts because yeah. that really we, we bring up in. a lot of controversial yeah. topics. So well, this and one for, is just aligned with thing. Yeah, you know, like absolutely. everything we do in life, just to have that like pause, that gentle yeah. pause, and remember why we're here and what we're talking about. And uh, yeah, absolutely. So on the topic of controversial things, I think one thing is the idea of home births versus giving birth in a hospital. And so we, of course, only grew up with the idea that you give birth in a hospital. We were never introduced to this idea, and it's only been within the last few years. And again, you know, living at a farm and witnessing birth that we've kind of recognized, like maybe going to the hospital is a very inconsistent with our, you know, the way that life is actually supposed to happen mm-hmm. and begin. Mm-hmm. And so if we could start there, maybe your knowledge between home births and conventional births, breech babies, hospital, you know, all these different things that they say that goes on if you do not take your baby to the hospital straight away. Yeah. So th- the, the best way to start is is looking back at history. So through all of time, babies have always been born at home or in a teepee or in a cave or, you know, anywhere that's not in a hospital. Um, like I said a few moments ago, uh, birth usually, we look at the trend. It was like 1930s. It started like 1905 and 1900, 100% of babies were born at home. So as we like moved through this upward progression of all of these births taking place at home and then going into the hospital, um, what we saw is a decrease in midwifery center based care and an increase in the obstetrical model of care. Um, The midwifery model of care is definitely one that believes that this is a normal physiological process where the obstetrical model of care is one that is an emergency waiting to happen that must be managed. Um, For years and years and years prior to COVID, I used to go into the UCI School of Medicine um, and talk to all of the residents, um, which I thought was actually amazing for them to have me come in. Um, And we would go through the different models of care. And it was just astonishing about how much there was um, a difference in the belief system. So when we take a step back and and just that alone right there makes, uh, you know, a a huge difference of how people take care of themselves. So, you know, your guys' podcast, you're attracting listeners that are um, in, you know, the pro-metabolic, the, you know, nutrient-dense food, the um, ancestral eating crowds. And um, to me, it just goes hand in hand with that next step of being like, hmm, maybe we should do something a little bit different. So, um, you know, we look at the statistics with uh, C-sections even. And um, when, as birth got more and more popular in the hospital, if you look at in 1970, the C-section rate was around 5.9%. Now, um, we average about 33% nationwide. Now, I live in Orange County, California, which is like, you know, this kind of fancy place. And um, there's a hospital down the street from me and I promise you their C-section rate probably ranges around 50% on any given day. So for us to have taken this normal natural process from, you know, the average of the the C-section rate being 5.9% to now almost guaranteeing that one in three women will give birth via C-section is just absolutely upside down and crazy. Um, 
you look at places like Brazil and China, Brazil is right around 80% of their women giving birth via C-section. China is about 50% of their women giving birth C-section. So it's not because things have changed. Yes, obviously we know like the obesity uh, rate has increased and, you know, we're not as healthy as we used to be, but our bodies structurally are still meant to give birth. And so we have to look at the management of birth and that's kind of what's caused it to, to go up. So um, it's also very money driven. Um, an average C-section, depending on where you're giving birth and what different like options you have included in that, can cost anywhere from thirty to fifty thousand um, dollars. Whereas a vaginal birth can be typically twelve to twenty thousand dollars. Now, home births are um, typically not covered by insurance. You have to really, really fight to get it covered. And I don't even take insurance because to me, it's not worth it. Um, but some of my clients will get reimbursed and our rates, and it's going to vary nationwide, but typically home birth uh, is about 4000 to $10,000 per birth. So, um, you know, you have somebody that's looking at those numbers and you're like, oh, I would have to come out of pocket, let's say $8,000, where if I go to the hospital, my insurance is going to cover more. So I'm going to be much, you know, it might be two or $3,000. I'm going to be much less out of pocket there. And I would say, you get what you pay for. You know, like, like most people are not even doing the research on where they, where they want to give birth. And this is a transformational point in one person's life. Okay. This is something that's going to affect them the rest of their life, regardless if it was a good or a bad experience. If you go to um, Alzheimer's homes and you ask those women, they won't even remember their children's names, but they will tell you the details of their children's birth. So this is something that imprints inside of us. And if you're not doing the research on this transformational moment, um, then you kind of end up with just like slim pickings of, what, of what's out there. But if you're doing the research, like I know people that do more research on their freaking wedding photographers than they do what their birth is. <laughs> so, you know, or buying a car, you know, like, like you're not going to just go in and just buy the first car you see on a lot. You're going to do research on it. And what is that going to be like for my family? And what is that engine like? And what's the gas mileage and all of that stuff? It's the same thing. Like we really need to encourage that we take back that power, that we do the research and we see what's best for us. Home birth is not for everybody. Um, you definitely have to be a low risk, healthy person to have a home birth. But um, it's definitely, you know, the majority of women are able to give birth at home. I think one of the reasons why, like, this community is so interested in the idea of home birth is because so many of us have been negatively impacted by childhood experiences, mm -hmm. right? So we now are seeing the consequences of certain things that have happened to us in childhood, mm -hmm. and they've now manifested as something in our 20s and 30s and beyond. Yeah. And I think something that we all realize now is how important the first moment of your life is because of your mother's like imprinting of her microbiome, all the mm -hmm. nutrients in the placenta, that imprinting on to you as a baby, it kind of like sets you up for the it's rest your of your life. Yeah. yeah it's your blueprint. And so can sure. you touch on like how important it is for a baby to actually go through the mother's v vaginal canal vaginal. Yeah. versus the C-section and what consequences there are from those two procedures? Yeah. So, you know, first things first, I want to point out that I don't know the exact latest statistic, but I want to say it's 47% of our children are going to end up with some sort of chronic disease by the age of like eight or 10 or something like that. That is insane. That's like astronomical. That has never been the case throughout history ever, unless we were like in a famine and like in the Black Plague or something like I'm that. I'm sorry, right? did you just say eight to 10 years old? Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. And that's increasing every single year. Like it's, it's astronomical. There's something wrong. SOS, you know, like we should be sending flares up to space, like something's going on. <laughs> and it's just kind of keeps getting passed over. Um, you know, we can even look at autism rates where before, like, I, I don't know how old you gr girls are, but I I was born in the 80s. And, you know, back then the autism, autism rates were like one in 10,000. Now we're looking at one in 32. 
Okay. Those numbers are crazy. And so it, we have to like not only look at the imprint of birth and that blueprint of birth, but we also have to look back like genetically. So our grandmothers, our great great grandmothers, when our grandmothers were pregnant with our moms, our moms were growing in our grandmother's wombs and making eggs that in turn made us. So take a second to ponder that really quick. Okay. Our grandmothers and her wombs, when it was gestating our mom, our eggs that made us were in our grandmother's womb. We are like one of those, uh, what are they called? Those dolls that you just take off the top. Yes, and there's one of the them. Russian dolls. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so like I know like my mom was born in 1950. My grandmother was given diet pills in 1950 because they said that she was gaining too much weight. Now, I know my grandma. During her was, pregnancy? During her pregnancy. She was raised on a farm. She milked cows every single day. She was a nutrient-dense, beautiful woman. Okay? So those diet pills, now I can't prove it, but I promise you, made my mom premature, three months premature in 1950. Okay? So I want you to imagine in 1950 what the NICUs looked like. Like my mom basically had no human contact. She was literally in like a little incubator. Thank God she survived or I wouldn't be here today. But she wasn't breastfed. She was probably given condensed milk. She had no human interaction. I mean, maybe a little. Maybe the nice like night nurse held her at night. Who knows? And that was that's her imprint. But that imprinted on me because of her eggs and her ovaries, which I became, which then is Lindsay, you know? So we can't just look at this like one moment in time because that's that's super significant. But we have to take a step back and like look at the demineralization of multiple generations. And then we get to take a step forward and not be doom and gloom and be like, okay, right now in this moment, I am changing that. I get to change for all of my future generations the damage that was done from the past generations over the last hundred years. So we go into preconception. We obviously want moms to start a pregnancy super healthy. We want moms to be not only in a good place nutritionally speaking, but also also emotionally speaking. We want there to be like a tilled garden, so to speak. We want there to be good soil. Um, any sort of trauma or emotion that's there should really be processed before bringing a life into this world because being a mother makes you face all of that shit head on no matter what, right? And so consciously welcoming a soul into this world. I call them spirit babies and bringing that soul in and saying like, you know, we are so ready for you. Please come and bring all of the things that you need to teach to us and this world. And then going through the pregnancy, making sure that the mom is very um, intuitive based with her eating, really eating that ancestral based nutrition. Um, and like, it's not like it could be like, go eat four ounces of liver in the first trimester because nobody feels like eating anything in the first trimester. So that's why you get this intuitive based part that I keep trying to bring in because there's guilt that comes along with the fact that if you're not doing what you're supposed to, so it's listening to what your body needs in that moment. Now, does that mean going to eat McDonald's? No, but it means like if you're craving salt, then why don't we get some really good quality salt on your food that you're eating, that you're craving, even if it's a bagel, make it a sourdough bagel that you make at home or get from a reputable place that has good ingredients. So we, we you know, change the nutrition throughout the pregnancy, let mom be super intuitive. And then as we get to the birth part, we know there's so much talk about the microbiome. It was a big thing like 10 years ago. And we used to really recognize this thing called vaginal seeding for our C-section babies. And so what that meant is that uh, we know when a baby passes through the vaginal canal. Now, side note, I'm going to come back to the vaginal canal with moms that have had antibiotics and labor for something that's called group B strep. So coming back to that. Exciting. But when a baby comes down through the vaginal canal in a normal sense, um, they are able to receive mom's vaginal microbiome right there. Like she, they're getting all of those amazing things as they pass through. It should not be sterile. We should not be spraying Benadine all over mom's vaginas. Like they're passing right next to the anus where some moms can poop for a reason. Like that's all part of it. Um, and what we, what we know is that Babies that are born via C-section um, don't get that. Obviously, they don't pass through the vagina. 
And so we used to, well, some still do. I recommend it, obviously, called vaginal seeding. So a mom would stick like a long Q-tip up into her vagina, and then she would seed the inside of her baby's mouth with her vagina right after birth. That would go through kind of and coat their intestinal tract for that first <laughs> you know, start to life, so to speak. Did you just say there's a, there's a Q-tip that goes through the vagina and then into the baby's mouth? So that it's like a long Q-tip and we okay. moms would take it and put it inside of their vagina, circled around a little bit, wow. and then they would seed their baby's mouth. When, when there's a C-section. When there's a C-section. When there's a C-section. Yeah. When there's I don't think C-section. that I got that. <laughs> I, no. I, didn't, I mean, I do I do believe I had a, I was a C-section baby, but I do not believe I got the Q-tip treatment. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't. It's definitely something, like I said, it was like Q-tube 10 years ago that it got really juice. popular. <laughs> Q-tip the veg juice. Um, I was a C-section baby too. I promise you my mom was not sticking a Q-tip up her vagina for me, you know? So, um, but it's, but it's the research shows, you know, significantly that it really helps, um, the, you know, for the whole lifespan. I mean, there's probably not any study that goes into a 70 year old because this is a newer thing that we're doing, but, um, we know that these babies, when they, when they get access to that microbiome, it changes their health significantly. So just, um, you know, C-section alone, we know that, um, their immune systems are weaker. We know that they have an increased risk of asthma. We know that they have an increased risk of allergies. Um, I think it's 50%. I I need to look it up, but I think it's 50% increase of asthma with, um, I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah. I just, while you're looking that up, I think it's really easy to understand how important this is when you think about the microbiome. Yeah. And we know so much of health is connected to our gut microbiome. And so if you're starting off in this world without that imprint from your mother, and so you're just maybe in sterile, I guess, mm-hmm. or whatever's in the hospital, and then you're thrown out into the world where we have so many different influences, maybe we have less than optimal food and you know maybe some viruses here and there, we should be able to keep that balanced because we have that good imprint. Mm -hmm. But when we are coming from nothing, I think that there's so much more opportunity for maybe bad imbalances to overgrow at that point. Yeah, of course. It kind of goes back to like, you know, the germ versus terrain theory, kind of definitely a controversial topic. But if we don't get that good terrain set up at birth, how can we expect to be able to withstand future exposures to things? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, there's like some studies are like based on 13 people. So I'm not going to give an exact statistic, but I know it's a significant Mm -hmm. risk in um, asthma going up with babies that are born via C-section. Even with just the research on children who grew up drinking raw milk and their rates of asthma, it would kind Mm -hmm. of maybe correlate to that in a way. For sure. For sure. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah. So I know you have a whole list of things to go over too, but I really just want to have maybe a simplified conversation on mm-hmm. the risks of home birth because I know that's a huge, scary topic for people, myself included. It's kind of like I'm in that stage where I do need to start doing the research for you know a few years down the line. Like mm-hmm. you said, I should be researching my new car and all of this different stuff. So, well, no, I shouldn't be researching. You get what I mean. Like, I know. If I'm going to do the research to get my new car, I need to be looking into everything about birth too. And so if I was doing this research myself, mm-hmm. If I were to type in, you know, to the first page of Google, what, like how risky home birth is, what would I see? And can you kind of debunk or maybe provide some more input on what we're going to read? Yeah. So first things first, like, oh, big, scary Google, right? Like, you know, know, all of anything that comes up in a Google search is typically some sort of influence over it, regardless of Harvard. Yeah. Harvard or whoever, (laughs) you know what I mean? Um, And so I mean, I know most of your listeners are kind of probably on the same train as me where, you know, like everybody's like, well, follow the science and read the studies. And you're like, based on what? Like, what is everything based on anymore? It's all bullshit. You know, there's some good studies out there still, but most of it is like based on who's paying for the study. And you really can't take a, you know, a look at those things and be like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Um a lot of people in academia aren't in real life settings anyway. So like I know on our medical board here, we have all of these like old farts that are like in the books and they're dictating what we can, um, you know, the care that we can give with, with home birth. And you're like, have you ever even seen a birth before? Because you don't even sound like you've ever seen a birth before. So, um, 
first things first, I actually want to say that home birth is going up drastically right now. Um, COVID has done a wonderful job at that because everybody wanted to get the hell out of the hospital. So um, we know that home birth increased 22% from 2019 to 2020. And I mean, I can see that in my practice. I mean, seriously, when March 2020 hit, my phone, I couldn't even handle life. Like I was like, it's not stopping. Like I'm literally getting a thousand phone calls a day. And it, I mean, I was full. I couldn't physically take any more clients, but I understood why everybody was so scared to go to the hospital. So, um, the best place to really look at research on home birth is not from the U.S. because there really isn't good data here. We've we've done a really good job with smear campaigns against midwives since the beginning of 1900s. There was old granny midwives in the South, and they you know were slaves that were brought over from Africa, and they had the oral tradition of being healing medicine women, which midwives is, have been throughout all of time. And you know the the newspaper started publishing pictures of these midwives saying that these midwives were dirty, and why would you have your babies at home with them and go to the hospital? Um, so you look at places that have a hell of a lot better infant and mortality rates than the U S like the infant and maternal mortality rates are abysmal in the United States. It is embarrassing. It is pathetic. There is no reason that we should have it. Um, the rates just came out last year from 2020 to 21, the increase of maternal mortality went up at least 40 for zero percent. Okay. Oh, that is unexcusable. Like I don't, you can take anything and you can say, oh, COVID this or COVID that, but like, I'm sorry, mom should not be dying while giving birth. That's total, 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 total bullshit. They're not receiving the care that's necessary for them. So if you look at countries that have really good maternal mortality rates, they are countries like England and Sweden and Japan and the Netherlands And at the root of all of the care that's given in maternity care, it's midwifery care, unless you're high risk. And that's appropriate. If someone is high risk, please go see an OB. There's so many amazing OBs that will take good, healthy care of you if you're at high risk. But if you are low risk, there is no reason that you need to be stepping foot into an obstetrician's office unless it's in a collaborative care situation where you and your midwife and the OB are working together on a certain issue. So. That's where you look at the research on those. And that's something that you can find. Like that's, that's you know, published all over. The World Health Organization, which I have my own little quarry about, but the World Health Organization even says that the, the, <laughs> the <who? laughs> um, that they are, the world is short 900,000 midwives because they see that like, you know, bringing midwives into communities is going to be the best way to improve rates. You can't have a surgery center at what they call operating theaters um, in every village in Africa. Like that's, that's, that's not something that they have the resources for. So if we start training midwives in culturally appropriate ways, meaning if they don't have access to boiling water, how are we going to make sure that their tools to perform, let's say, optimal cord closure where that we cut the cord after the the cord has stopped pulsing is with clean scissors. Mm, They might not have that. So let's teach them ways to like burn the cord instead. So to cauterize it with just, you know, simple fire, that's something that they might have in their villages. Um, Those things right there are going to reduce rates for all of those mortality rates immediately. So there's fantastic podcasts out there now where I would look outside of Google. Um, there's a uh, obstetrician that I'm really close with. He's one of my dear friends. His name's Dr. Stuart Fishbein. He moved out of the hospital setting and started moving into the home birth setting, uh, I'd probably say like 2008. Um, and he 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 really started stepping in in 2014 when the state of California took away our um, licensure to uh, be at breach births and twin births. So he would come in and make it legal. Um, And um, mind you, prior to 2014, we were doing twins and breach births at home with no problems. And so he, he came in and really got this different sense of view because he was, you know, this high powered OB that worked at Cedar sinai and, um, you know, experienced very medical managed birth and then kind of stepped into this like home birth, like following midwife setting. And his experience with birth is just incredible. So he's Birthing Instincts. They have an amazing podcast. Um, 
the Down to Birth podcast show. They're like, There's just so many good places to look that are outside of what's mainstream. Uh, there's a really good website that's evidence-based birth. She goes through the latest studies and kind of gives her spin on, uh, you know, with a non-biased um, looking back at the, all of this stuff. Uh, there's a documentary that was made in 2006 by Ricky Lake. Ricky Lake is a talk show host. You guys are probably too young to remember her, but she was famous in the 90s. And um, she got enthralled by birth and she had home births. And so she made this really amazing documentary with her friend, Abby Epstein. And that was 15 years ago. And I really feel like that single handedly started changing home birth and the climate people were aware. I mean, it got out there like, you know, Ricky Lake was friends with celebrities. So you started seeing people like like Cindy Crawford and Pamela Anderson having home births. And then the community kind of started to listen. So um, they're actually revamping that right now because they just got the rights back to that film um, from having it being sold for 15 years. So that's a really good place to start. There's another really good documentary called Why Not Home that was done a few years ago. And that's um, actually looking at the Bay Area up in San Francisco, different um, healthcare providers, nurse practitioners, OBGYNs um, that chose to have a home birth. And so it kind of goes through the whole process of why they chose to have a home birth. And both of those films have fantastic statistics in them. Um, and it's like an easy thing to like watch with your partner. You know, like most guys are like, oh God, what is this stuff? I don't want to see somebody give birth. It's bloody and gross. And like if this is like visually appeasing and aesthetically done where you can like kind of like reel them in to listen to their research that's presented beautifully in both of those films. So one thing that I have been led to believe is if you look at like human lifespan, mm -hmm. right? Like a lot of the medical community will say like, wow, we've increased our lifespan so much mm -hmm. due to Western medicine. And one of the things they say is um, one of the biggest reasons is because of infant mortality rates. So we have reduced the number of infant deaths due to our like hospitalization and births. Um, what is your counter to that type of argument? I mean, yeah, we're saving babies at, earlier, you know, like we were at a place where um, like a 26 weeker would never survive 30 years ago. And now these babies have the advancements of neonatal technology and the NICUs where they're able to survive. Um, most of those kids have health problems and that's not something that anybody's going to sit here and deny. Most of those kids are, you know, usually a little bit developmentally delayed. They typically have some sort of vision stuff going on. So making the infant mortality rates better, I don't think that that's making our longevity rates better. And there's just a study that came out last week that said that our U.S. Ex life expectancy rate is continuing to drop after COVID, where other countries that we're not seeing that trend, you know, it's, we're, it's we're the only developed country that has a decline in our healthy life expectancy Yes, in the last two measurement periods, I think. Which is like, that. that's another thing, like sound the alarms. Like, let's like, like, let's, let's talk about this people. Why, why is this happening? Um, I have a uh, advantage of my sister who lives in Sweden. And um, one thing that was really interesting to watch with all of the 2020 stuff, I try not to say the, the, the C word, but um, they never shut down. They like, not like literally, like she has two kids. Schools never shut down. They still went to restaurants. They still rode the buses and the trains. When they came to visit us, once like the borders opened up in 2021, we didn't see them for a whole year. The first time that her kids ever saw somebody in a mask was on the plane ride to the United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. Their rates were so much better than ours. They're all, like, like in, in the elderly population and their, you know, immune compromised populations, all of those rates were so much better than the United States. It's just, it's, you know, it's ridiculous what we're doing right now. We don't, we're like, I, I kind of feel like medicine right now is like just pulling things out of our ass and hoping it works, you know, like, like what shit's going to stick on the wall? Like, let's believe that. And that's just not how we should be approaching anything in life really. And so, you know, when we take a step back and let me tell you something. I think that that COVID was one of the most important pivotal pieces of our trajectory as the human race, because either you woke up to what was going on or you didn't, or you kind of fell somewhere in the middle and you just felt like it didn't feel right. And then you started doing a little bit of research and then got pulled back in again and then started doing a little bit of research. But what it's done is it's brought us back to the belief system that 
our bodies have the innate ability to heal themselves. Now, again, not everybody thinks this way. However, if we kind of keep coming back again and keep coming back again and like, oh, that didn't work too well. Oh, that didn't work too well. Oh my God, we have an immune system. Like that's supposed to work. Um, that, that, that's changing people's belief systems. I see it every day. I see it every single day that people are, you know, they come in and they sit on my couch for appointments and they wouldn't have picked to have a home birth prior to 2020. They're like, whoa, something's wrong here. You know, like they're seeing the red flags that are pumped popping up and they're starting to make decisions that are totally different than they would have made three years ago. Yeah. I think that this discussion kind of brings us back to this whole like innate nutritional or just innate wisdom of life and nature. And the, a lot of Americans think that we can outsmart Mm -hmm. mother nature. We can Mm -hmm. outsmart biology you mean like the with the meat that's made in a lab isn't as e- good as the meat exactly. that is from the cow? Yeah. And so it's like this is happening with food and it's also happening with like medicine and birth and mm-hmm. things like that. And seeing like firsthand on the farm with just how natural of a process this birth was. And then like you were just saying, like the body, given it, its right tools, like the body knows how to heal. Mm-hmm. Um, so can we kind of transition a little bit into like so you've now seen a ton of clients mm-hmm. and I think we all know how important like pregnancy nutrition and pregnancy prep is. Can you briefly talk about like some differences that you've seen with nutrition things for births that have gone well and maybe yeah. births that haven't gone as well? Yeah. So um, it's it's really interesting because I just did a, a mini documentary with Paul Saldino with um, Heart and Soil Supplements. And um, it got me pretty shadow banned on Instagram. Um, and I was like, how is this possible? Like I post pictures of boobs and vaginas all the time and I've never gotten in trouble. And now one second I sit and talk about the difference of a placenta of, um, you know, somebody that was very well nourished and somebody that wasn't and I get shadow banned. It's like, come on, like they're obviously Obviously, has to be something that's bigger at play there. Um, and in this documentary called Nurse, which you can easily do a quick Google search on, I know that it's posted on Heart and Soil's YouTube page. Um, I actually had the opportunity. It was like a super random opportunity. Like literally, I was driving home from a birth at 9 p.m. And the next day we were recording and I'm like, holy crap, I have a placenta of a mom who literally ate me her entire pregnancy and a mom that was super undernourished. And like she she did add in um, liver supplements at the end of her pregnancy. So it wasn't like a total vegan pre- uh, placenta or anything like that. And I had these two. Now, here's the here's the problem with the internet. When people see that, they make the assumption that there are all placentas of vegan and vegetarians are going to look like that. And all placentas of people that eat meat are going to look like that. That's not the truth, you guys. Like, let's let's have some discernment here, right? Um, it was just that in that moment, I had these two placentas. And that was what these two specific individualized people's placentas look like. So what I see over and over and over again is if we have a mom that's eating intuitively, that's eating very nutrient dense based food, that is eating what are the way that our ancest- ancestors would have eaten, ancestral eating, that they proceed through the pregnancy typically in a very healthy manner. Now, I'll remind you, I have low risk women. So they're starting their pregnancies healthy, they're not coming in with any underlying health conditions. Now, these women are intuitive with making sure that they're getting, you know, enough to drink, that they're moving their bodies, that they're in a healthy mental space. And what I see time and time again, and there's no research on this. Who is going to fund the research that shows that this happens? It's just, it's not going to happen. And what I see time and time and time again is that when my uh, vegetarians that come to me, I will never turn somebody away from being vegetarian. Like I'm not that person. I am not an all or nothing. I am like, let's connect. Let's connect our hearts. Let me listen to you. I want to hear how you feel. I want to hear how you feel in your body right now. Are you eating based on trying to be part of like something that you like this group that you're part of? Are you eating based on what your body is telling you? And what I see time and time and time and time again is that my vegetarians and vegans will usually start eating meat at some point in the pregnancy because they're craving it. Okay. Just based on what their body's telling them. My sister was vegetarian for 19 years before she got pregnant. 
The second that she got pregnant, moving out of her first trimester, she craved me. She was like, I'm thinking of like bloody steak right now. What is wrong with me? I oh, don't wow. even remember what that tastes like. And so, and she had heard it from me prior to getting pregnant that, you know, you need to listen to your body. You need to be really intuitive with your body. And, and she started, she started eating meat in her pregnancy and she just felt so much better. So I, I usually find that like you, that at some point they'll, they'll come into eating something that's appropriate for their body, be it like just ground beef or maybe some chicken or maybe incorporating in some eggs or something. They'll usually incorporate in some sort of animal product and they'll start to feel a lot better. In my few experiences where women haven't, um, and not all of them, this is not dogmatic, but in my few experiences where women haven't, I typically see the most issues with the placenta. So I've had a raw vegan who had a placental abruption. Okay. I've seen one placental abruption. I've seen a couple partial. I'll I'll tell you what that is. The placenta abruption is when the placenta, which is attached to the uterine wall, is there's blood flow that's going through the uterine wall into the placenta, and that is the house of the baby. That is what's feeding the baby. So placenta abruption is when the the placenta starts to detach from the uterine wall. Okay. It's an emergency. That's bad. That's an emergency C-section so your baby survives. Okay. Before, can you tell us, for those who don't know, myself included, the importance of the placenta and the purpose it serves before we go into this? Yeah. So the placenta, like I just said, is the baby's home. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is where the baby lives and grows. You create this organ brand new for every single pregnancy. This is a specific home to your baby, to, to that pregnancy. And so what is created is the, you know, there's these maternal cotyledons, which are these like spongy type, like, you know, it's kind of like a liver, but they're more spongy. You know, if you're looking at a raw liver and those attach to the uterine wall, and then there's two bags of water that are created. So there's the amnion and the chorion. So everybody always thinks like, oh, my water broke. And it's like, no, there's two, you know, like sometimes, sometimes you think your water broke and maybe one of them did, but maybe the other didn't. Our bodies really try to create this environment where our babies can grow really healthy and in a really safe, um, you know, I I hate the word sterile, but it is a sterile environment, you know, like they're, they're, they're living in this amniotic fluid and, um, that's enclosed in these amniotic sacs. And then the, the umbilical cord attaches to, you know, your belly button, obviously, but it also attaches to the placenta. So that umbilical cord is feeding your baby this life nourishing nutrition on a 24 seven basis. Like they're constantly getting that source of nutrition. And so the beautiful thing is that, Babies are typically always well nourished. Like it's the moms that get the depletion if they're not taking care of themselves, right? Like, you know, we can see babies that come out that you're like, oh my God, like she was not eating at all really good in this pregnancy. And these babies are beautiful and healthy and, you know, seven pounds. And you're like, oh, you're, you're depleted. Like, you know, your iron levels are really down right now. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I was in Bali last year, um, and one of the traditional midwives there, her name's Robin Lim, Ibu Robin. She's created this beautiful birth center that provides free care throughout the island. And I, I loved her description so much of the placenta because all of this is very spiritual to me too. Like there's there's this huge component of spirituality that comes along with birth. And um, how the Balinese people revere the placenta is they say it's the guardian angel, the body of the guardian angel to the baby. And so once the baby's born, the placenta comes out in that body of the guardian angel. The, the guardian angel leaves the placenta and goes up to the heavens and is that baby's guardian angel for the rest of its life. And I'm like, oh, like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Because even when I hold a placenta, like it, it, I revere it. Like it's this like sacred, holy object that just grew this baby. And it's just, it's such a beautiful thing. And, you know, when you've spent enough time with birth, like you'll realize, like, even if the baby was born three hours ago, if you pick up that placenta and start feeling it, I'll, I'll go through it with some of the kids. Like if, you know, the mom has older kids, I'll show them the placenta and stuff like that. It gets really warm again. And it starts to like respond to your body and the color kind of becomes a little bit more vibrant. And it's like, that, that doesn't make physiological sense. That's incredible. Um, Yeah. So there's, there's, you know, a lot to the sacredness of that placenta. It's a really, really beautiful thing that we should revere a lot more. So you mentioned the exploding 
Yeah, the placenta, placenta exploding. <laughs> the, the placenta abruption. So that was my my only experience with a full placenta abruption. I've seen many partial abruptions. Um and and those are um they're typically from moms that aren't nourishing themselves well. And the placenta is kind of like I got nothing left to give to you at this point and they it starts to adhere off of the uterine wall. I don't know the incidence of placenta abruption in mammals. Um but I would I would like to think that it's very low. Um, I mean, it's probably higher in like, you know, like the awful conditions of nasty farms and stuff like that. But in terms of the way that you guys are doing it, I'm sure that you'll probably never see a placental abruption. Um, So there's just, there's so many pieces to look at. And, And like I said, I never come at it in a dogmatic way. I always come at it in this way of like, how are you feeling? Like, let's just, let's just sit there with it. Like, how are you feeling? Like, how can you nourish your body in a way that makes you feel best? What nutrients does the placenta provide? Everything. Because something very consistent with the two births that we had at the farm, Mm -hmm. the first thing Mm -hmm. that both the goat, Esperanza, Mm -hmm. and the dog, Josie, Mm -hmm. the first thing that they went for was was they smashed the placenta. Yeah. They ate it. They ate it. They didn't like, Sorry. Well, uh, they, I use the word I smash. As yeah. in like, they lit- like, that was literally the first thing they did was they mm-hmm. ate the placenta mm-hmm. and then cleaned the baby, cleaned that outer, that use the second layer sack that mm-hmm. you were talking about. They cleaned mm-hmm. the outer layer sack after that. Mm-hmm. They ate the placenta first. Okay. So you get to look at this from a couple of different ways. First things first is that if there is meat available, if there is any predators around, they're going to smell that Mm -hmm. and that's going to make their babies at risk for being eaten, right? So first things first, if you are in a cave and you are your great, 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 great grandma and there was a lion outside, if it smelled really nice and juicy in there with fresh meat, that lion would try to get in. So that's Mm -hmm. first things first. Okay. Second thing is it's probably one of the most nutrient dense organs ever created. I there's, you know, it it's going to vary based on mom's nutrition throughout each pregnancy. So to have a side to side comparison of like a liver, a cow liver and a human placenta is going to be totally different. But this is a uh, organ that grew specifically for that mom, specifically for that baby. Okay? So it's based on all of the hormones are bioidentical to that mom. All of the the nutrients that are typically needed are exactly right for that mom. Um, you know, one of our our midwife tricks is if we have a mom that starts to bleed more after birth, so it's also referred as a maternal hemorrhage. Um, you know, Western medicine gives us something that's called pitocin, which is a synthetic form of oxytocin, which we can give um, intramuscularly with an injection, and that helps contract the uterus, and then that helps stop the bleeding. Now, if I didn't have access to that, you bet your ass the first thing that I would be doing was taking my hands and getting out a little chunk of that placenta and having mom put that in her mouth, which would then in turn help her stop bleeding. So there's, you know, I'm sure that your your dog and your goat has an intuitive knowing of that, you know, it's going to replenish the iron of the blood they just lost with their birth. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I say it all the time, mammals eat their placentas over and over and over and over again. And in, in westernized birth, we stick it in a you know, plastic bowl and send it down to the hospital incinerator. And you hope that, that your hospital isn't selling your body organs, which they do, um, for shampoo and face creams and all of that stuff. Um, and it's not, it, it's, we don't even look at it as any, anything. We just discard it. But um, I would say that probably 95, maybe more percent of my clients um, encapsulate their placenta after birth. You know, some, some women don't necessarily want to eat it raw right after birth, but they'll, they'll take it. And placenta encapsulation, it's done a different, you know, a couple different ways. One of them is the traditional Chinese medicine method, which is they, um, steam the placenta. They cut the, the cord off. They cut the bags of water off. You're just left with the meat of the placenta. They steam it and then they, um, stick it in a dehydrator, uh, typically for about 12 hours. And then that is, ground up and put into capsules. So it's taken like you would take a, you know, capsule of liver, so to speak. So 
what are the advantages other than just replenishing nutrients? And would you say that's the main one of consuming the placenta? Replenishing nutrients. And then we need to talk about the hormones. Like I said, there it's bioidentical okay. hormones that are in this placenta as well. And so, um, you know, like a lot of women will report a decrease in postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety. Um, a lot of women will report increased milk supply um, with doing placenta encapsulation and there's not tons of research on it, but when you talk to moms that did not encapsulate the first time around and then they do the next couple times around, they'll tell you that there's definitely a difference. So is this even an option in the hospital? I'm assuming not. It is actually. So oh, it is. Hospital specific, obviously not all hospitals have the same yeah. exact policies, but the majority of, of hospitals, it's it's yours. It's your organ. Like you okay. have the right to take it. Right. Um a lot of hospitals will have a uh, consent form that you sign that says that you, you know, you'll have it leave hospital prem- premises within 12 hours after birth and you, you'll provide the cooler to have it leave. But um, if you just do a quick like Yelp search on placenta ca- encapsulators in your area, you'll typically always come up with with somebody um, and they and they are usually the ones that pick it up and then provide that service for you. I mean, that's good to know. So if, yeah. even if somebody was high risk and they needed to end up in the hospital, they still have that opportunity. And they so still have that opportunity. No, should they definitely ca- take advantage. The caveat to that is if there is any form of infection, like if mom has a, f- mm. a fever and labor, um, you know, there's there's anything that we're worried about with infection, I wouldn't take it, but that's very rare. There, you shouldn't be infected during labor. <laughs> so yeah. So on the topic very quickly about the high risk, is yeah. that something to do with more of like a chronic condition somebody's dealing with? Yep. Yep. So it's, it's okay. like my, um, mamas that come in that have like heart conditions or like hepatitis or any of, uh, any of those like, you know, chronic lifelong conditions. Okay. Now, sometimes people are like, well, thyroid disease. I, you know, I have thyroid disease and there's some midwives that will be like, well, that's too high risk. But for me, I've, I've learned to really work with, you know, moms that have thyroid disease and have really beautiful outcomes. So it just really depends on what the midwife is comfortable with. I think there's a hormonal component there too, because with hypothyroidism, you're going to see elevated estrogen. And so um, our great friend, Masha, who works here at our farm was doing a lot of research on goat pregnancies. She's our goat midwife. She is. I love it. I want to be a goat midwife one day. <laughs> You're welcome to one come. Day we will bring you here <laughs> I and love you will experience a goat birth. Yes. I love and that. so she was doing a bunch of research, you know, into what the goat should be eating leading up to pregnancy. And there's a ton of information regarding limiting high estrogen foods, mm-hmm. um, like soy and legumes. Mm-hmm. And that was in hopes to avoid a premature birth. Like this is well established right. in the goat nutrition space. Yeah. And so it makes complete sense that you would bring up this incredible importance of hormonal balance. Yeah. It's funny, right? Like how is there stuff that's in like the goat midwife handbooks? <laughs> I don't know what you would actually look at, but that like that's well established, right? Like you look at like veterinarian medicine and it says like you should really be avoiding these high estrogen based foods. So the goat doesn't have this, this, and this. Like why isn't that available for pregnant moms? Because yes. it's political. Too guys. much money. Too, much, too money much money at stake. She was telling us that this information is so clear in terms of like vitamin E consumption, calcium consumption, all of these different things that we're not considering as humans, copper mm-hmm. consumption, the mm-hmm. balance between copper and iron and the outcomes of pregnancy and the importance for this goat's health mm-hmm. that is kind of almost like a complete 180 mm-hmm. in what we're told for our nutrition as humans. And it's mm-hmm. just crazy. Um, but I'm wondering if, I mean, I'm, it's pretty clear that that's showing up in the statistics that we brought up in the beginning. So, yeah. And, and, you know, it, like when you just go like, you know, mammal to mammal, like any mammal that like goat, horse, human, whatever, like we should all be getting those really nutrient dense forms of food that we're eating throughout our pregnancy. Um, should, it's, I mean, nobody should really be consuming soy, you know, like, th- like those things should just be like kind of assumed. It, you think about like what that's doing to uh, baby boys even, you know, like that's, t- it's crazy. I just recently saw that um, one of the newest things that WIC is going to start promoting, which is kind of like, um, oh gosh, I think it says WIC stands for Women, Infants, and Children. And it's a government-based program for women's, women, infant, and children. And uh, their b- biggest thing right now is they're going to start promoting soy form- formula because it's not 
it, you know, they're, they're so against all this animal based stuff that like, oh, let's start promoting this. And it's like, hello, Weston A. Price has done really good uh, research on soy formula and why we should literally avoid it like the plague. Yeah, formula um, is such a triggering topic for well, so it many is. people. It Even is. in the formula that's maybe not soy based still has like soybean oil in it. Oh, it's all seed that. oils. Right. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. It's disgusting. Yeah. Um, not, like it, here's like, I come back on my like non-dogma train, right? Like I hate dogmatic people. I think it's so sad when we have such division. I think the greatest illusion that we're living in in this world is that we're separate. We are not separate. When we are separate, they, they have that power of division over us. And so like, there's, there's these camps that people live in and it's like, like, you know, breast is best is not something that's politically smart to say anymore. And it's like, no, hello? Like, of course breast is best. Now, have I seen moms that can't breastfeed? Yeah. Are there breast milk banks where you can get human milk for human babies? Yes. Are there other alternatives if we can't even access that? Yes. So, it's not like we're saying go let your baby starve and die. We're just saying that like actually nutritionally speaking, this is the most optimal thing to feed your baby. And if you can't do that, bless your soul for trying or having your reasons not to. Here are some alternative methods that that will kind of try to mimic the nutrition base that's in breast milk. And breast milk is going to be different for every single person, for every single baby, at every single stage, depending on what they're exposed to. Like if, if big brother comes home from school and is sick, there's something that's called an inner mammary pathway that mom's going to start picking up on all of those antigens and start making all of the antibodies that are going to start passing to the baby through the breast milk days before that baby would even have symptoms of being sick. So, so you're naturally inoculating that child every single time that you're breastfeeding it. Um, that, that doesn't happen if you're not in that space, you know, with uh, biofeedback that's continually on a loop with a mom and a baby. A couple of days ago, I posted a, um, a scientist, I don't know what kind of scientist he is, uh, from England. And he did a, um, a microscopic view of breast milk versus pasteurized milk. And I posted it, it got posted all over and, you know, they, like I had these like camps of people coming in, like saying like, how dare you promote this and like breast milk? Why, you know, you should compare raw milk versus breast milk. And I'm like, yeah, that would be a really great comparison. But guess what? The babies that are being fed formula are being fed pasteurized milk. The majority of the people that are consuming milk are consuming pasteurized milk. So it's it's not an apples and an oranges comparison because when you're talking about what that baby's being fed, if you're feeding your baby breast milk, this is what it looks like. If you're feeding your baby formula, this is what it's going to look like. And although it wasn't actually formula, it was pasteurized milk, it was at least the basis of what that formula would potentially look like under a microscope. Probably formula would look a little bit more dead than pasteurized milk anyway so yeah it's just it's just interesting and and that, like I said that's the the downfall of of social media and people hiding behind their screens because everybody gets so damn worked up over mm -hmm. everything and everything's so controversial and it's like no let's just come back to the basics people like it's oh okay gosh, yeah. to to have these different uh nutrient-based things that are really good for us even if you can't provide them you know yeah I mean I mean I would rather I feel at this point, give my baby, if need, absolutely last resort. I would rather do pasteurized milk at a certain point than some vegetable oil laced yeah. formula. And so yeah. obviously I think a good alternative, if you can't breast milk, you can't get the banks, would probably be raw goat's milk. Raw goat's milk. Um, I'm going to give Weston A. Price Foundation a plug here again. They have a beautiful uh, formula recipe that okay. you can make. It's really cool. easy to access. Below. Yeah. Okay. I, you did mention very briefly baby boys on the topic of soy. And so I asked at the beginning when we were talking to each other before the call started, if you had any strong feelings towards circumcision. And so I just wanted to get your take on that. So let's say immediately after birth, you know, you have a beautiful baby boy. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion on the very common practice of circumcision? So 
I always like to kind of start these conversations about circumcision with taking out all political views aside and just imagining that you are this brand new baby in this world. And the only thing that you've known for the last nine months is, you know, the swoosh of the amniotic fluid and the sound of your mom's heartbeat. And you're always warm and you're always being fed. And you just go through this, like, you know, people could say traumatic, but very stimulating sensation of birth. Earth, right? You're, you're either squeezed through a vaginal canal or you're taken out of a cesarean incision. And you're like in this new space that's bright and everything's really loud and you don't know what's going on. And then you're put back in the comfort of your mom or your dad's arms, right? And the world seems safe again. Now, if you were to take that baby, sometimes 24 hours after birth, and take that newborn baby and strap them down, onto a plastic um, plastic board, essentially, with uh, straps on it, strap them into this board, and then go ahead and, you know, make them naked and cold and away from their mom, and then continue to take a scalpel to the most sensitive part of their body, the most nerve endings, the most condensed nerve endings on the human body, and cut that off where you then have an open wound that has to be covered with Vaseline and gauze that then gets pissed and shed on for the next two to three weeks as it heals, what would your view of the world be, right? That it's not safe, that that was really scary, that, that, you know, like what, what, what was that? Now, this is a subconscious memory. Most males will defend this. I don't remember my circumcision. But the blueprint that we talked about at the beginning, that blueprint of what you think life here is on earth, is that of violence? Is that of shock? Is that of pain? I don't, that's not a really good way to start life. And so I'm really passionate about this subject. And the reason I'm so passionate about it is because when I worked in the hospital, I was a lactation consultant in the hospital, and my lactation clinic sat right next to the newborn nursery. And prior to even really having done any research on circumcision, when I started hearing those baby boys scream, cry, when they were getting their circumcision, something in my body physically happened where I wanted to break through the door and break down the glass and save them. Okay. Like every hair on my body stands up when I remember these moments. And I always said that I would be the voice for baby boys that don't have a voice. And so it brings me back to this, this space of like, but, but why, like, why did we start doing this now? religion is a totally different topic. I'm not even going to go there. But if we look at why circumcision got brought to the United States, so I want you to think Kellogg cereal, okay? Dr. Kellogg. Are you serious? Sweeties, Mm -hmm. are you serious? In the late 1800s with this puritanical belief system said that if we circumcise baby boys, that it would decrease their chance of masturbation. And if we decrease their chance of masturbation, that they wouldn't become insane. They would decrease the insanity rate amongst males. So there's that. And then there's also this piece that comes along with the component of a mother's job, the the most innate thing that a mother is supposed to do with their children is to do what? Protect them them safe. To keep them safe. And so if we peel these babies out of their arms and tell them that this is just a routine cosmetic procedure, then the second that happens, Western medicine is already asserting control into that maternal relationship with that baby. Again, the whole thought process of like, I know better than biology. I know better than nature. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine circumcising baby goats? <laughs> right? Like, could you imagine doing something like that? Could you <gasps> imagine giving baby girls breast implants because they want their boobs to look like their moms? I like, like, really? I have a kind of funny story about this. It's not the same as circumcision, but we have five pigs. Mm-hmm. We have two males, three females. One of the males had his balls chopped off at birth uh-huh. or whenever he is the least is this tiny 
This is Tiny. His Tiny's name is Tiny. the Hello. most afraid of us. He doesn't mm-hmm. come by us. He obviously has this traumatic memory of a human wow, cutting so. off his balls. And I've mm-hmm. told my fiance Brandon this. Um, and you know what? This was a very challenging topic to talk to him about, um, Brandon, because I'm most not a male. Men. Most men yeah. in the United States. I'm not a male. I don't mm-hmm. have a penis. I don't have the same you know, maybe he's heard something from one male friend, something from another where like, oh, bad experience with, you know, infection down there or something, or, you know, they read something. I don't have that same level of investment in this topic prior to becoming, you know, wanting to become a mom, right? Uh Because what if I have a boy? Uh So I'm working on developing this way of communicating with him where I can present my concerns about this topic without trying to overstep because I'm not a male. Mm -hmm. But I really do have, like when this topic was brought up in our house the other day, I had this like innate like need to defend my future male child and say, this is not going to happen. Because Because, why? Because because it just seemed, it seemed ridiculous, seemed unsafe. It seems super counterintuitive, right? Yeah. It's like down in the depth of your soul. It doesn't feel like we should be doing that, right? Yeah. Yes, we shouldn't. So yeah. I, I'm going to bring it back to to animals. I have um, two German short hair pointers and um, they are crazy, but amazing animals. And that's a very common uh, dog um, breed that they dock the tails on. And I'm like, they're circumcising the dogs. <laughs> can, I, can I request that the dog isn't docked? Because I just feel like that's such a traumatic thing again. And um you know, I, I, I like encourage you to just listen to like your deep intuitive spot in your soul of why that just doesn't sound right. And I also really encourage you to do the research on it because, you know, like, like the history of it's kind of like, whoa, Dr. Kellogg, that's crazy and weird. But like, um, when was your fiance born? What year? Um, 19. He's a young one. Yeah. 88. So 98, 98, 98. Yeah. He's, he's a baby. So, um, (laughs) we look at the statistics and, you know, that generation, our generation, it was, uh, like 98, 99% of boys that were being circumcised. So there wasn't really a differentiation. Now, obviously there was people that were immigrating in that were like, what the hell are you crazy Americans doing? We're not going to do that. But, um, it was something that was like, kind of just not even, they didn't even really give good informed consent for it. They just took your baby to the nursery and circumcised your baby boy. Um, now that rate, I wish we had new statistics on this because this is probably like five or six years old now, but it's about 50% of baby boys are being circumcised now in the United States as a whole in the Western states. So Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, we're looking about under 23% of boys are circumcised. Oh, yeah. So it's it's drastically falling. Um, one of the reasons is that the insurance companies are considering it a cosmetic procedure now and not covering it. So people aren't paying out right. of pocket for it. Those range anywhere from $600 to $1,000 for um, paying out of pocket for it. So people are just like, yeah, what's the point of that? Wait, yeah. literally chopping that off costs $600 to $1,000? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, th- all medical procedures. I mean, I'm surprised it's Goodness. not more. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. The, the other thing is looking at it in a, a world sense. Like we're very egocentric here in the United States and we kind of like think the world revolves around us. And if you look at the rest of the world, it's about an 80% circumcision rate. Um, uh, sorry, a n- non-circumcision rate. So 80% mm-hmm. of the world is not circumcised. So, um you know, let's back to Sweden again. You know, it's, it's like one of those things that like when I talk to uh, Swedish men, they're like, you guys do what? Like, yeah. that's so weird. Like, why would you do that? You know, like it's not even a conversation piece over in Sweden. In my brief research into the topic, again, like that's why I wanted to talk to you about it today because mm-hmm. I haven't looked into it enough. Um, I feel like parents should be given a disclaimer, like how we have those commercials with the medicines that your child will be at an increased risk of depression or anxiety Mm -hmm. or some sort of psychological issue due to this instant traumatic experience. One of the worst risk of circumcision. What is it? Death. Oh, wow. A baby boy bleeds to death. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And it's, it's something that like, it's documented. Like it's, it's, it's not something that's a common risk, but can your child die from being circumcised? Yes. Why? Mm -hmm. Why would we do that? Why would we risk? Why would you give your baby a medical procedure that they could die from when they're like 24 hours old? You yeah. know, like, I mean, I've seen, I've in my own practice and I have a really, really low circumcision rate in my practice. And I've seen a mom once that um, had their baby circumcised. Uh, they were Jewish. They had a moil do it. And usually by day eight, this uh, vitamin K levels are high enough where they there isn't any bleeding issues. But for some reason, this baby's still 
really bled, like really bled. And she came to my house like with him in the backseat begging me to give him a vitamin K injection because she was, he was bleeding way too much. And that's, that's horrifying. So not only did you have the trauma of the experience of being circumcised, now you're freaking bleeding. You know, like you're, you're getting this, this wound changed. And so, um, there's a, there's a series that was done years and years and years ago by uh, two comedians called Penn and Teller. Um, and they did a show called Bullshit. And they did a deep dive into investigating circumcision. And they like made it like in this com- comedic sense of like kind of debunking it, but like making it funny and making it okay for Amanda to like watch and listen to. And um they did a really good job debunking it. And they like brought on like porn stars and stuff, you know, like it was like one of those things where you're like, oh no, you're really actually like, like doing the like deep dive with the interviews and stuff like that. And that's usually when I always have dads watch because it's, it's like crude and funny and like makes them laugh. So it takes the charge out of it, so to speak. And then they're like, Oh God! I don't, uh, why would we? Why would we do? Why was I circumcised? Can you sh- send me that link yeah, and I'll include it? Yeah, that, that'd people. be awesome. And mm-hmm. the other thing to look at is that it's not it's not done with um, consent. So there's lawsuits that are starting to happen now from boys that were circumcised as infants that are now suing doctors that did this medical procedure and permanently disfigured them uh, without their consent. Oh my gosh. Well, how yeah. does a baby give, you know, can't, well, they don't. That's, that I mean, that's consent, why we shouldn't you know? be doing something that's permanently, yeah. you know, changing what their body looks like yeah. until they are able to consent to that. Right. And so I guess the argument for them is just because there's lower risk of infection or something like that. But that's very my, debatable. I mean, I, it's, <laughs> it, you know, that'd be like saying that we have to cut off our labia so we have a lower risk of infection. It's like, no, they know how to clean their penis. You just tell them to go. The foreskin doesn't typically retract until they're about four years old. And then that's because boys are always playing with their penises anyways. And so <laughs> once they're like in the shower playing with their penis, you're like, okay, honey, we actually have to wash that now because once the foreskin retracts back, then that's when the the risk, the potential risk of infection could go up. Um, I recently was just talking about how the Bill Gates Foundation went into Africa and really started to um, donate money to pay for circumcisions in Africa to potentially reduce the HIV rate. And it's like, could you bring them some condoms instead? Like, like, come on, like, really, mm-hmm. that's what we're going to do. How about we talk about how to, ways to have safe sex, people? Like, let's, it's just so ludicrous, the conversation around it. Well, they're now funding research to give cows masks. So, oh yeah, I saw that yesterday. I'm like, is this satire? Like, is, what the hell is going on right now? Cow burps are yeah. the problem. Yep, folks. that's the problem. Uh, yeah. I mean, either way, I feel like it's the mom's responsibility one to keep the child safe, and then two, when it comes time to clean, teach that sanitization. You know, if for male argument female. for both, yeah. but for males right now, if that's the argument that, you know, oh, you should have gotten a C-section or sorry, a circumcision. circumcision. Yeah. And so just that's our responsibility. Yeah, of course. Well, I think like, I hope this conversation, I, I feel like the, one of the biggest takeaways I've had from this conversation is it's not just important to plan. I'm going to have a baby. I think I hope this is encouraging everyone to plan how you are going to have that baby because before, during, and after, before, during, Mm -hmm. and after, because quote, normal isn't all that normal. Mm -mm. It's It's not not all that natural. It's not working. Mm -mm. And so just going to the hospital for your birth, you may like 10 years from now, look back and be like, oh, I could have done that differently if I would have known better or something like that. And so I just hope that this conversation kind of empowers someone to start researching and looking into these matters on their own yeah. so that way they don't feel overwhelmed like imagine trying to make these decisions while you're giving birth like mm-hmm. make these decisions well in advance yeah. yeah 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 you know i i had a beautiful birth last night of uh, um, a mama that had her third baby it was a 10 pound baby boy and the, um, her mom was there and uh, she her mom had had four kids including my client and she looked at me afterwards. Uh, she she actually followed me out of the room and she she said, God, I really wish I would have known that this was a possibility when I had my babies. And it just, I hear that all the time. You know, it just breaks my heart because when someone actually experiences and steps into that like really sacred, sacred, holy reverent space and experience something that's so 
different than what they've experienced, it, it gives this level of like grief, like, like, why wasn't I able to have that same experience? And so, yes, like if, if this does anything, like, please let it just be like, listen to your intuition, like go back to that remembering of your great grandma call that's in your bones, you know, like th- those, it's not that far removed, you guys, it's just a couple generations back where this was the, that, that beautiful power that was given to our, our ancestors of birth. And so, I recently just saw a a meme that said like every time that someone has a home birth, like the ancestors are cheering them on and it's like, yeah, like, like really it's something that's that important for us to step back into with our remembering of our strength and the remembering of um, our innate power within. Yeah. I think um, prior to that, we need to maybe get off birth control Mm. and start thinking a little bit more about natural. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah. I mean, I say that because I feel like you can't even be in touch with yourself Mm -hmm. if your hormones are not your own. And so Mm -hmm. that might be step one, but I, I, I've absolutely loved this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think we should have Lindsay on again to talk kind of about pre and post nutrition and how that impacts birth and things like that. Um, so I know that when I am ready to give birth sometime in the future, I'm going to come to Lindsay's house, stay with Lindsay. <laughs> no, I'll come to the home. farm. <laughs> and, oh, that's true. <laughs> have Lindsay come here. Um, so if other people wanted to have this home birth experience, what are what's your best recommendation to find a Lindsay near them? You know, I get this question quite a lot and I wish I had, and I, I probably will start to um, have like a referral based situation because not all midwives are created equal. And I think that the problem right now within the midwifery community and the medical community in general is that people think just because someone has one title means that they are kind of all encompassing of the same thing. And that's just not the truth. And I've seen women that have had really bad experiences with midwives and then, you know, kind of are forced into this free birth world. And I'm like, oh, that's definitely not how our, you know, grandmothers were doing this before. They were always surrounded by other women and not doing this alone. And um, I think it's really just starting to talk to women in your community and, and, you know, like really kind of like listening to the stories of people that have had really good experiences surrounding birth and see, you know, like, well, who did they use and, and what did that birth look like? And is that something that feels intuitive to me? And then, and most of the time, um, you can find midwives that, you know, will always do like a free consultation and, and go through questions and stuff like that, that you guys have, but arming yourselves with even the questions to ask. So, um, I'll send over those uh, podcasts that I recommended earlier and just kind of, you know, perusing through those different podcasts and seeing like which things are really important to you for those experiences. Because again, remember that Alzheimer's patient that remembered every detail of their birth. And so it's really important for you to get a good match with somebody in your area. And there's there's amazing midwives everywhere that you, you just have to search to find them. And, and they're typically like revered as, you know, like the best town midwife and you, you'll, you'll find them. It's not hard to do a search for it. Great. So in terms of getting in touch with you, yes. where would somebody start? So the best way to find me, I'm super shadow ban right now on Instagram. So you have to spell my whole name. So I'll, I'll make sure that you guys have the spelling of that, but it's at Lindsay Milis. And then my uh, website is the remembering.co. I love that. Cool. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you again for coming on. Of this has course. been such a great conversation. It was amazing. And we'll there's so many to... things we didn't get a chance to talk about. I know. So we'll have to do a part two because there's, you know, like the breach stuff you guys asked me about. I, I would love to go into that. Oh, please. You came with so much stuff ready to talk about that. We didn't even address it. So well, yes. we will, we'll schedule offline. We'll put another date on the calendar. Yeah. Hopefully awesome. a goat birth or a goat birth. birth doesn't interfere yes. with the next one. But um, yeah, thanks so much, Lindsay. Awesome. Thank you guys.